Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm Daita Sergi, Educations Program Manager with AISHI, and I'll be the moderator today. It is my pleasure to welcome you all. As many of you know, AISHI's mission is to inspire and catalyze higher education to lead the global sustainability transformation. We are an international association with about a thousand members spread across more than 20 countries, including New Zealand, Oman, and United Kingdom. We serve as the professional home for campus sustainability staff, but we offer resources for everyone in higher education. We provide an expensive collection of online resources, networking tools, and educational events, such as today's webinar and an annual conference and expo, which will be held in Pittsburgh, October 2nd to the 5th. Registration closes on September 17, so make sure to register now to join us in Pittsburgh. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but please feel free to ask questions or provide comments at any point during the presentation. You can do that by typing your questions in the questions pane in the control panel on your screen. If you have additional questions or comments, please email them to education at age.org and we will get back to you. At the end of the webinar, you will have the opportunity to provide feedback regarding today's presentation. We take your suggestions into account when planning for future webinars, so please do provide this feedback. Lastly, please note this webinar is being recorded. If you experience technical difficulties or have to leave early, you and others can view the recording later with the presentation materials. Today's webinar is the kickoff event for um, Campus Sustainability Month. And I'm going to share with you, sorry, the wrong link, um, the link to the Campus Sustainability page. Which um, event is held every October and is an international celebration of sustainability in higher education. Throughout the month, colleges and universities organize events on campus and elsewhere to engage and inspire incoming students and other campus stakeholders to become sustainability change agents. Every, every fall, thousands of students arrive on your campus for the first time. So this is a great opportunity to start the sustainability conversation with them. We try to make it easy as possible for campuses to participate. On the Campus Sustainability Month website, you'll find a toolkit that you can use to promote your events, as well as several engagement opportunities in October that you may wish to incorporate in your uh, plans. Additionally, Asian and Bullfrog Films are offering 25 Asian member institutions the opportunity to screen one of four movies in October for a discounted rate. See the website for additional information. Given that this year is a election year, we are encouraging participants to make voter education and outreach a key component of CSM. Getting students excited to vote may be, the among, may be among the most important ways that campuses can contribute to sustainability this fall. In collaboration with the Higher Education um, Association Sustainability Consortium, or HIAS, Today's webinar will explore how to overcome barriers to student electoral participation. AISHI serves as the coordinating body for HIAS. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Deborah Rowe, co-founder and director of HIAS, and the president of the U.S. Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development. Deborah? Thank you. Thank you for all of your work organizing this webinar, and thank you to all of you who are watching it either live or will be watching it recorded. We are working on such an important issue today of engaging our students in our democracy, building a healthier democracy by making it um, possible for students to vote, giving them the information they need. And you're gonna get a lot of great materials on that today that you can utilize on your campus in the next couple of months. I wanna talk about HES for just a minute. Um, HEASC has been around for well over a decade, and we are a network of mainstream higher education professional associations. Our commitment is to advance sustainability both within our own constituencies of each of our associations and throughout the whole system of higher education in the United States. 
and beyond. Many of our members are professional associations for college and university presidents and chief academic officers. We have a reach to well over 80% of all of the campuses in the country. Uh, beyond those leaders of presidents and chief academic officers are other associations who are part of HEAS, include student affairs and housing officers like ACPA and AKUHOI. We also have um, the Campus Safety, Health and Environmental Management Association. We also have the business officers, the procurement officers, the facilities officers, leaders in co collegiate recreation, and more. So if you haven't looked yet at the resources that he asked has for you, it's at ashe.org slash he ask. Please do so. Share it with your staff on campuses so that we can all get more done in terms of building a sustainable future. We saw this as a really high priority, these organizations this year, to make sure our students know how to engage in the elections and um, to vote. So uh, with no further ado, I hand it back to you uh, to uh, introduce our other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And at this time, I'd like to introduce today's webinar presenters. Paul Loeb is the founder of the Campus Election Engagement Project, or SEEP. He's the author of multiple books and has written on social involvement for many publications. Paul's work offers an alternative look at current social issues from poverty and taxation to criminal justice, environmentalism, and citizen activism. He also lectures at num numerous college campuses and national conferences. Uh, in, he is also the um, inspirer of the American Democracy Project, uh, which is, was done in collaboration with Ask You, a HEASC member, and now exists on over 200 college campuses. Robert Newsom is the Director of Outreach and State Relations at the National Association of Independent College and University, NICU, which is also a HEAS member association. Who is responsible for coordinating projects to help NICU members become more active in the public policy arena, and he also helps coordinate the National Campus Voter Registration Project, a nonpartisan effort sponsored by the National Higher Education Associations to register college students and employees. More information about the presenters is found on the ASU website under this webinar listing. It is my pleasure to welcome all attendees at this time and thank you for joining us today. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to Paul to get us started. Great, well, glad, glad to be here. And, and can everybody hear me okay, I think, uh, if my voice is coming through. There was a, um, a video monitor, but it seems to have gone away. Um, so I'm the founder, I mean, I think the most salient, I, I did participate in a, in a conference that some of the provosts said had played an important role in founding ADP. But what I really, um, in my, my key role in higher ed is founding the Campus Election Engagement Project. Um, and we're basically, we, we worked with, directly with about 300 schools in 2016. We're probably on target for about 400 um, this year. And then we create resources that we encourage you know, all other schools to use. And uh, Deborah of, of, of ASC has been sending them out as well, as well as their partners like the State Compacts. And so what I want to do here is just give a little bit of an overview, and I'm really looking forward to the question period. Um, we have, we're, we're a nonpartisan project, and so we, our goal is how do schools use their institutional capacity to essentially get their students registering to vote, get them navigating the complex voting laws, getting them educated on issues and candidates, and of course showing up at the polls, as well as volunteering, which obviously multiplies their impact. And when I look at, when I sort of from the very first point that I founded the project, when I looked at what their role can be, it, it seemed very important to recognize that there's a couple of intersecting barriers to participation. So there are the practical barriers, which is you're a student, you don't know where to vote, you don't know how to vote, you don't know where to register, you don't know how to, whether you need ID or don't need ID. And schools can uh, and, and have, as, as we work with them, as other groups work with them, have provided all that kind of 
uh, material. Then there's what I would call the contextual resources, which is a school, a student may very well be registered, um, but they're cynical and they think their vote doesn't matter. And they say, you know, it's not gonna make a difference whether I show up and the candidates are all the same and they're all corrupt. So I don't wanna be corrupted by the process. So I'm staying home. So those two intersect and reinforce each other. And essentially what we do is to create resources to get the students past the hurdle and then bring in various, well, really as many stakeholders as possible to make that happen on a campus. And one of the, the first things that we always talk about is how the campuses need to build nonpartisan teams where they're not just, I mean, maybe, you know, if you're lucky, the president's office is on board, but they're awfully busy. So you've got student affairs, you've got student government, you've got faculty from different af academic disciplines, you've got residence life if you're a residence hall. And I would argue actually, that um, sustainability officers can play a significant role having uh, presented at, at sustainability conferences and, and, and written about this extensively. One of the things, or actually my Soul of a Citizen book uh, features a young woman who at Virginia Tech who went from not voting her first opportunity in 2004 to creating a system-wide sustainability plan for Virginia Tech and becoming their first sustainability officer. And one of the things that I've noted in the process of writing that, but also talking with folks all around the country, is that sustainability officers don't just work with any single department, they work campus-wide. And that, that, that gives you a, a really, powerful opportunity to essentially be organized and advocates bringing in just in the same way as you'll look and say okay here's this department what could they do differently in terms of sustainability in terms of the physical impact um, you can also in a sense be advocates for what can they do in terms of uh, engaging their students in democracy and so I, I will as I'm talking I would urge you folks to think of yourselves in that role in some sense as organizers as opposed to oh I have a very narrow silo what can I do within the silo because to me your silo touches the your silo isn't a silo it touches the entire campus and, and that's a real opportunity and I know that there's folks on from other kinds of disciplines and and departments as well but since this is the hosted institution thought I'd try and make that tie so circling back again what can a school do so when we look at registration we kind of break it down and we provide resources. If you see on the screen right here, we have a master resource called, um, called, called Seven Key Ways to Act. And what it does is it essentially takes us through, and I'm not gonna walk through every single segment of it, but you know, there's building a team, there's registering students, there's educating on issues and candidates, there's helping them volunteer, there's building up to election day, and then of course there's getting out the vote and then measuring your impact. And so when I look at that, and I don't want to be distracted too much by the visuals, but essentially a successful team involves enormous numbers of stakeholders, the more the better. So I look at something like Virginia Tech, which is one, one of our, or Virginia Commonwealth actually, which is one of our model campuses. And they've got the provost office involved. They've got the honors college involved. They've got poli sci and communications faculty and student government. They generated a project where students multiplied their impact by working with a public housing project called Mosby Court that was nearby to register voters, restore felon rights and um, arrange rides to the polls. And all of those aspects intersect, I, yes? I apologize, but um, you need to start, click on the button to start sharing your screen. Oh, okay, all right. Um, okay, so in other words, I disappeared. Or something no, disappeared. See you. you. We see the webcam, but mm -hmm. not your screen. Now it's oh, okay. there. Thank okay, you. great. Now we can see it. Now we can see it again. Yeah, I was trying to get it out of the middle of the screen. So, you know, again, I'm looking at this, you know, model where you have as many stakeholders as possible, because essentially, if you think about a campus, there it's often segregated into different tribes. And some of them participate at higher rates, some of them participate at lower rates. So for example, the data is now suggesting that STEM fields participate at significantly lower rates than say social science majors. And so, you know, you've got to try and figure out some things to get the STEM fields involved. Um, because you really, as a campus, you really want to involve everybody. And so you also have to, I mean, when you're, you're looking through the kinds of hurdles, you know, there's how do you get them to register? First hurdle. And the 
Unfortunately, there have been in recent years significant numbers of new voting laws that make that process and make the process of voting harder. And the, the way I, the metaphor I tend to use is you're 18 years old and you've just arrived on campus or you're commuting into campus and there is the voting booth, I don't know, down the hall and there's seven pits of alligators in between. And you're looking at them and you're thinking, oh my God, those alligators look hungry. They have really sharp teeth. Uh, maybe I'll just stay home. And so the, the job of the school is to say, well, in fact, we have resources to navigate you and we, we supply these with partners um, to navigate through the voting laws and to give you exactly what, you, what information you need to bring what you need to register and vote. And then at the same time, and this, this loops back to the um, larger motivational question, we do nonpartisan candidate guides. I'm going to share an example from Virginia last year. And what our guides do is they essentially give students the resources to understand what the differences between the candidates are. So in this particular case, in Virginia's governor's race, I'm just going to climate change because these are the, you know, this is, these are, you're the folks somewhat interested in that. Um, you know, you had a, one candidate who was somewhat ambivalent about whether it was human caused, supported withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accord, opposed the US Climate Alliance, and another one who supported the Paris Accord and supported participation in the US Climate Alliance. And so, you know, when, you know, and similarly, there was an interstate initiative to limit levels of greenhouse gases. Now, and they had different stands. We do not, and, and it's really inappropriate for a school to take a stand and say, this is how you should feel on this particular issue. Um, but we point out the differences and you go down the list and, you know, we basically look at everything from, you know, how they, whether nonpartisan uh, redistricting is something they support, you know, gay rights, healthcare, immigration, marijuana, minimum wage, uh, whether they agree or disagree with the president, um, how, what they want to do on taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially all the issues that the students are going to have to, in some sense, be impacted by and that the communities are impacted by and basically giving them a chance. And let, let me describe kind of how it plays out is I remember I was speaking at a college in Minnesota and it was Winona State and they gave me a math class and the last math class I had taken was geometry in high school and so I didn't know what to do so I thought well okay I'm just going to ask them if they voted or not. Minnesota happens to have extremely good voting laws which facilitate voting and no coincidence has the highest voting rate in the country. So I asked them and half this particular group did not vote. Again, STEM fields vote at lower rates. And so I said, why? And they said, well, everybody's lying and everybody's spinning and they all have handlers. You can't trust any of the politicians or candidates. And I don't want to vote for the wrong person. I don't really know where they stand because you can't believe their ads and their statements. So that's why I stayed home. And a bunch of people agreed with them. And then somebody said, well, if there was just a list where you could see where they differed, then we would, uh, we would participate. And, and, and everybody agreed. And, and we, uh, I thought, oh, we have our guides, but we just didn't have any working in Minnesota that year. So that was our hypothetical affirmation. Sounds like a big word, combination of words, but you know, essentially meant it did reinforce what we were doing, but it wasn't completely clear that if they were the guides, maybe they wouldn't have voted anyway. So then the next day I'm at a school in Wisconsin, they give me a class, 90% of them had voted, I think it was 95, all but one. And I'm really excited. And I said, well, what, you know, what's the secret sauce? And they said, well, there were these guides in our mailboxes and you could see where candidates stood and, and everybody agreed, yeah, that, that made the key difference. And then the professor said, well, you know, those are your guides, Paul. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's what allowed, we thought they were great. We thought they were fair. We, we have a 19-year veteran of Encyclopedia Britannica vetting them as some really skilled researchers. And um, they said we printed 4,000 copies and put them in everybody's mailbox. So that is, you know, is, is a way to um, essentially address the sense that, um, you know, everybody's the same. But it's not the only way. So part of what we're trying to do is to get, and I'm clicking over to student government, uh, and we 
um, we do what we call election engagement fellows at schools where we can um, afford to support them, but schools often can support their own through academic credit or through uh, work study or through uh, student government. And so having, this is this is VCU again, they have these, uh, their motto are the RAM, so they have an Uncle Ram poster, which I really like. And um, this is, you know, they're, they're basically showing guides to, I think, uh, I'm not actually sure what they were doing there. Was, oh, it looks like it was a t registration table, and you know, with their with their campus image, uh, you know, as Uncle Ram, but wants you to vote. And so, essentially, you're trying to again bring in the different stakeholders, and this is this is really key. And so, you know, th these are student fellows, and um, you know, that's and that's part of what student government can do is because you really want is you want from multiple different directions. Uh, there's a, I don't know if you folks know the metaphor that uh, the environmental bill for Kib Kibben wrote, uses on climate change, but he says there's no silver bullet, there's silver buckshot, meaning that there's not gonna be a single solution that solves climate change. And I think he's correct on that. And in the same way, I would say there's no single solution that solves the challenges of student voting. I mean, in 2014, 80% of students and young voters stayed home. Actually, I think it was about 81%. You know, so there's a lot of room for improvement. And it's not going to come from any single place on campus or any single approach. So instead, you know, what we really want to do is to um, have you folks, or at least that's what I want you folks to do, to essentially bring in as many stakeholders as possible. And again, it isn't always the expected folks. Uh, I'm going to give an example of, you know, the athletic department. So, you know, who would think that the athletic department would have any particular way to get people involved? In, oh, you know what? That one actually isn't. It download. I need to talk to our webmaster, but it downloads instead of, well, I think if I click on it. Yeah. Okay. There it is. Um, so, you know, uh, you can read it, but essentially what, you know, the central story is that Central Michigan University's football game, all the athletes had registered the participants, they held up their registration cards at halftime, announcing that they registered. There were 30,000 people in the stadium. They invited them to do the same thing. And the Jumbotron flashed a link to the school's voter engagement website. And so we took that, um, that example and we put together a resource of other examples for athletic departments. Now, again, I'm hopping around with different departments, but if I look at your role, you're touching an awful lot of different folks. And so what I'd be advocating is that you folks essentially see yourselves as organizers and think, okay, here I am, what could this group do? And there's a decent chance that there's already a SEEP resource about it. Um, but even if there isn't, um, then, you know, we, we certainly, have something you know if i go back to our our master guide seven key ways we basically look at just about um this is understood we're still on building and planning but just about every facet of engagement um we've got some kind of answer some kind of way to do it from registration to um you know here's how you do a dorm storm um here's a registration and orientation we have a separate resource on that here's the athletic department again and you know, when you go through it, we have guides on how to, how to, instead of registering people from behind tables, you get out and you actually, you know, you approach them. So all those kinds of things and some, you know, examples for each kind of capability that we want schools to, to, to incorporate. So essentially that's the, you know, that is the model that we have is getting students and getting institutions at the schools from, again, act, student activities, residents like student government, all of them pulling in the same direction and overcoming those dual challenges of, we don't know how to vote, we don't know the logistics, in fact, the logistics are quite difficult, and we don't think that our vote matters. <clears throat> we even have banners we distribute, I'm gonna scroll to find them. Um, where did they go? Um, thought we had a, a, now I guess this one doesn't have a, uh, um, a visual of it, but we have a, <coughs> wonderful banners which just say your vote matters and the schools use them to spearhead parades to the polls and registration tables and pretty much everything else that's possible <clears throat> so that 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 is the core of it and i think what you know what well, the other thing that i would add is that 
a lot of times administrators and faculty and staff complain about student apathy. And, and I would argue that in some sense that's misplaced. And I would say that if we view engagement as contingent, that is contingent on what you and other stakeholders do, there's enormous potential for involvement and students do respond. I mean, we've had, I'll give you one example, which is Ohio State, you know, huge school. They had 7,200 more students vote in 2016, which was an election with a lot of adverse wins because students were pretty cynical about the candidates than they did in 2012. Why was that? Same, same student population, basically. Why was that? Because they were gradually doing more and more. They have a coalition called OSU Votes, and they were doing more and more things to involve more stakeholders, reach more students on the campus, and the students respond. So, you know, it is, I mean, on the one hand, it is extraordinarily important for students to vote this November. And on the other hand, it is also a long term process where you do build cycle by cycle by cycle. Uh, implementing the kinds of approaches that in, in fact make a huge difference. So why don't I leave it at that because I, I want to leave a decent, good amount of time for questions. I know Bo has some, some things to say and then we can uh, and then we can circle back uh, on, on more conversation. Thank you, Paul. I'll switch to Bo now. Uh, Bo, you are the presenter. Take it away. And Paul okay. Can you block your webcam, please? Oh, okay. This is very high tech. We're putting a piece of paper over it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, thank you, Diana, and thank you, Paul. Uh, again, I'm Robert Bo Newsom. I'm the co coordinator of the National Campus Voter Registration Project, Your Vote, Your Voice. Since 1996, the Your Vote, Your Voice campaign has encouraged and supported college and university efforts to inform and facilitate voter registration, education, and get out the vote activities on campus and beyond prior to gubernatorial and federal elections. That's what we focus on. The National Campus Voter Registration Project is co-chaired by the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, my association, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, and our sister association, the Council of Independent Colleges, and is supported by 54 member Washington Higher Education Secretariat. Paul just shared a number of great stories and pointed you in the direction of some, of some very useful tools. I would like to start by sharing something I learned through my coaching experience uh, and was confirmed by the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, CIRCLE, which it does, was in uh, housed at Tufts University. And that is, people like to be asked to do something, especially if that something is positive. Uh, think about volunteering for a soup kitchen or fundraising for a worthy cause. If you ask, people usually come in droves. Uh, the same thing can be true for registering to vote. Registering has to be connected to something of interest, like climate change. And when young people register, they tend to turn out to vote. So like, like Paul said, you know, if you get them going, they will turn out. Now, according to Circle, in 2008, when Barack Obama was making an historic run for the presidency, the great majority of the 18 to 29 year olds who were registered, and that was the key, they were registered, voted. Now we know the problem is 18 to 29 year olds still confront barriers to registration, be there lack of time, lack of information, lack of interest, or just general confusion about the process. Now, uh, I haven't looked at the list of registrants, but I would hazard a guess that the majority of you that have tuned into this webinar are passionate about addressing climate change, support conservation efforts, and strive to live sustainably, at least we hope so. While I hate to be ER, but if you listen to those who are running for office, you hear them talking about the economy, jobs, and lots of other competing uh, issues. So if you look at um, the screen now, you'll see this is a Gallup, recent Gallup poll. Uh, environmental issues is way down there, you know, towards the middle. You know, it's after healthcare, after crime and violence, about the budget, guns, drug use, hunger and homelessness. So there's tons of competing issues um, that, that run ahead of, of climate change, sustainability, and uh, conservation. So how do we make addressing climate change and sustainability 
a public policy priority. We have to work to elect champions. The Council of State Legislatures posted a report that said in 2017, just under 50% of the members of the House of Representatives and Senate previously served in the state legislature. So think about that. Uh, just under half of the folks in Congress, both on the House side and the Senate side, you know, we would, they wouldn't like us saying it, but they started in the minor leagues. They started in their state legislatures. So that means, and uh, you kind of, you heard Paul say it in his presentation, uh, a little, a local elections matter, state elections matter. So we need to encourage our communities to engage in these races. Don't just look at the presidential race. Don't just look at these races in the midterm for the House and Senate federal races. We need to look at local, local elections as well. Uh, the key is, though, to make sure we are mindful to make our efforts nonpartisan. Now, as advocates, we can advocate for issues that are important to us, but we should invite all qualified candidates to forums, town halls, et cetera. Anything you are sponsoring on campus, you should invite the qualified candidates to participate in. Nearly every special interest group surveys folks running for office to measure how they stand on issues important to them. Uh, think of farming, Chamber of Commerce, the Sierra Club, something, you know, do we need a traffic light on the third corner? Uh, do, do we need better airbags? Groups uh, survey uh, people running for office to get a sense of where they stand. So uh, folks on campus should create surveys and invite candidates to share specific steps, ask them to be specific, and how they will address each of your core issues. Now, uh, I have to tell you, if you've been watching political ads or TV, if you watch news at night, you can tell people are tired of the bickering and negativity in politics. Uh, so we should be sure to encourage a civil dialogue and discussion of the issues on campus, encourage people to listen, not with the idea of responding, but to truly listen as to find common ground and a way to move forward. We're never going to move forward on, on or sustainability or climate change unless we're, we're going to have a good kind fruitful conversations. And uh, as a person that works in public policy here in Washington, D.C., I want to let you know that those who win their elections will long remember how they were treated on the campaign trail. I'll, I'll say that again. Those who win their elections will long remember how they were treated on the campaign trail. So it'd be, it, it, it makes sense to make sure you have a fruitful and lively uh, debate, um, but it should be respectful. Um, here are some other things that folks can do on campus to uh, get engaged and get, encourage students to, to, to get engaged. Uh, you should volunteer on campaigns. Let candidates know you, you hope they will be a champion for conservation. Every person running for office needs people to work the phones, canvas the neighborhood, drive people to the polls, or post yard signs. Right? Out, you, those yard signs don't just get put up on their own. Somebody volunteers are doing that. The other thing we don't think about, because we're all not-for-profit for the most part, is donate to campaigns. But think about Ernie, uh, Ber Bernie Sanders. Even small amounts matter. And make sure when you make that contribution, say, hey, look, I'm giving you this 10 bucks because I, you are supporting the important issues that in, in my stance and sustain, on a sustainable future. Uh, volunteer, you know, we're in the academic world, so volunteer to write white papers or issue briefs that can be shared that demonstrate that policies that support sustainability creates jobs and improve the quality of life now as well as in the future. Too often, we in sustainability talk about future benefits rather than spelling out how, right now, a positive change in direction is a good and productive thing. Right, so we're always kind of looking down the road. It's hard to point down the road and say, hey, this is what's coming. So remember, we have to give people a reason to care about the November elections. We need to ask them to vote to register. First, we have to ask them to register to vote. Then we got to share the wealth of tools. Paul had a bunch of tools. We did see a bunch of tools in our organizing handbook. And so share the, the wealth of tools on how they might engage others. And it's important to engage others. And then educate them on the issues. And then, of course, <laughs> finally, because you've done all that hard work, you got them registered, you got them educated, you got them excited, you've given them a cause, something of interest. Remind them to vote on Tuesday, November 6th, Election Day. And that's all I have.
Thank you so much, Bo. And uh, we will now go to questions. Um, Deborah, would you like to take it away? Sure. First of all, thank you to both of you. Um, great speakers. And I think we should have you do a lot of different presentations uh, between now and the next election, not just for this November. Um, my question is, uh, for both of you, um, and I've been calling the questions, but I've seen what the response is here. Um, you got a, not a lot of time between now and November, right? You've got staff that's already busy. So what are some high impact activities that can be done even given the short timeline? So you want to start with Paul and then go to Bo? Sure. I mean, I think we, we actually, um, if you, I'm going to go over to our website, which is canvaselect.org. Where's our, our master guide? That's just right. Um, so if we, if you go to our you guide. You have to share your screen. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I don't know how to do that now because it's not giving me the option. Um, it, it went away. Maybe it's still on Bo's hands. Is that possible? Or yours? You have to, I need, you need to pop up the thing. Here it is. Okay, great. Share my screen. Okay, great. So if you go to our site. Um, and we've been working, we work with schools year round, but you know, it's these next two months as, as Deborah says are really critical. So we have, I mean, a lot of the building, some of the building capacity stuff is already happened. You know, it's, some of it takes longer lead times. On voter registration, we've got a whole suite of different resources for all sorts of different stakeholders. Voter education, different resources there. You know, everything from Constitution Day to debate watch guides, how to encourage student volunteering, as, as Bo mentioned, very important. How to combat cynicism, an, an essay I wrote with uh, Sandy Aston and Parker Palmer. Um, how to engage your student newspaper. Uh, you know, getting out the vote. We've got social media memes, uh, even a 90-second video on close elections. Um, we're, we're putting together with a partner, uh, Fair Elections Legal Network, posters on voting laws. Uh, we've got the guides, as mentioned. And in all, you know, in all of these cases, essentially, you know, think of how do you involve as many people as possible. I mean, some things are very, very straightforward. I mean, any campus, at least at the senior administration level, has the capacity to send in, out information on voting dates and deadlines and what you need to bring. Uh, and, you know, if you're in a state which has our guides, send out our guides. We most of the schools we work with have done that. Uh, you know, that's really important. If you want to do, if you're residential, a dorm storm is really powerful, both for voter registration, where you go and you get permission from you know, your residence life folks to have uh, student organizations canvas on a given evening. And, you know, you can also do it for get out the vote. Um, there's, you know, I mentioned the social media, um, this is, you know, closer to the election, but there's a bunch of memes that we've created uh, with, with a partner over the last couple of years. And, you know, we're, they're, they're on our site. They're all downloadable. But again, I mean, I would say that, you know, if you're starting from absolute zero, then there's still a lot you can do, but it's going to be a scramble. Uh, if you already have some folks engaged, then the question is really, how do you address the different complementary facets of first getting them to register, getting the information on the laws, getting them information on you know, how to make up their mind on the candidates, and then getting them getting out to the polls, including early voting, which, as we found, is you know much more effective because it gives people multiple chances to vote. Uh, and if they miss the first chance, they can still do the other one. So to me, you know, it's the intersection between those different approaches, again, the silver buckshot, and the intersection between the different stakeholders on campus. And you can do something very powerful, even with a small number of folks. But obviously, if you've got a broader team doing it, uh, you're going to have more impact. Yeah, and I would just add that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're hitting into back to school time, right? So there's going to be lots of activities on campus. Uh, welcoming students back and, and and organizations will be doing signups and those sorts of things. So I would I would suggest folks tie into the back to school activities and sort of piggyback on those. And then you have a couple other links. So uh, Constitution Day is coming up September 17th. So all schools, all colleges, and universities are supposed to remind students about the importance of the signing of the Constitution. That's a good time to educate people about the issues. And this is why we, you know, we've sacrificed to get these, the, the ability to, to have our vote and our votes count. 
And then uh, September 25th is the National Voter Registration Day. So again, it's an opportunity to link into national activities where you can send, or, or like on, on uh, National Voter Registration Day, uh, you can create an email uh, or send out a newsletter, have linked to the, the state voter registration forms, or so people can uh, request absentee ballots. They can look and go to Paul's site or, or the uh, uh, Secretary of State, whatever site, and look at the ID uh, requirements, because that's something that folks are always concerned about. What's the ID will I need? And have all that stuff lined up in a, in a short email or short newsletter and tied into those big dates. Constitution Day, uh, uh, September 17th, National Voter Registration Day, September 25th, and just and, and tied into the overall back to school activities. Right. And we have, if I'm, uh, we have a, a resource on Constitution Day specifically, so it's there on our site if you want to go through and, you know, select different activities to do. That's perfect. That's perfect. Great. So another question that I have is, um, I've talked to a number of people, whether they're sustainability coordinators or they're chief academic officers or faculty or staff or community members, and they say, you know, I really want to do this. I start to read the material and it gets overwhelming. And then I, I find that they, I just don't know what to do first. So I wondered if you could help them uh, answer that question of what do I do when I feel overwhelmed so that I can still be useful? Um, I know that I've, I've said to people, just ignore the feeling of being overwhelmed and keep moving forward and get to something concrete. But I wondered if the two of you wanted to add something to that. Paul, you want to go first and then go? Well, it, I mean, it's something I write about a lot in my book, Soul of a Citizen and the Impossible Will Take a Little While, um, you know, which sort of were the genesis for the project in part. And, you know, I think part of it is focusing, you know, you can't do, there was a 102-year-old environmental, well, she's dead now, but environmental activist who I profiled and so on. She said, you know, do what you can, you can't do everything, but you can do what you can, and then you can do some more and do that. So part of it is parsing, you know, part of it means you turn off the TV or the, you know, or don't go to all the websites. You know, if you don't manage to catch the furor over the latest tweet, um, you'll still be doing the work you need to do and, you know, avoid getting sucked in by just the sort of flux of our times. I think that's probably the most critical. And, you know, the other is, again, this is why team building is so important is you don't need to do it all yourself. So you just break it down in manageable chunks. And, you know, you probably, again, if your school has been doing nothing, there's a lot to do, but probably your school has been doing something. So what you want to do is to, and we actually have an assessment tool to sort of look at what, you're, what schools are doing and what schools aren't doing. And so you basically want to say, all right, what can we do that's high impact? And, you know, maybe Three years from now, if we start working now, we'll be able to do even more, which is certainly true. But there, at any stage, there's things that can be done. And, and, and again, part of the way we, we design our resources on our campuselect.org site is to sort of sequence things uh, in, within a certain amount of timelines. And so, you know, you don't have to do everything, but there certainly are a lot of things that are really, you know, really impactful. And if you do some of them, it's going to be more than if you hadn't done anything. So a part of it is just letting go of the temptation to do everything. And I would probably guess that all of us on this call and all you know, listening or presenting face that same dilemma of too much to do. Um, but you know, it just, you do it and, and you do what you can. In terms of priorities for sustainability, um, I know that this election is very, very important. And some of the other issues, though, that you listed on that survey, um, actually are in the social well-being side of sustainability, right? That people can earn a livable wage, that um, when people have something bad happen to them, there's some kind of a safety net that helps them get back on their feet so they can be contributing members to society instead of, you know, blaming the victim, so that we can understand the country's needs so that we can respond more effectively. But those other issues that were on the um, survey that you said we can also bring into our discussions of sustainability. It's not just the environmental side. You're right, Bo, when you said show how it makes jobs. It's economic as well as social well-being. And so we can get a more sustainable future, not only for future generations, but for us as well. So um, thanks. Um, you know, Bo, I'm used to calling you Bo. Should I be calling you Robert? Because we're on a webinar. But in any case, you have something. <laughs> 
you have something my mom would be happy my mom would be happy she's yeah <laughs> robert was was the way to go but uh most folks know me from professionally as Bo. no i wouldn't uh, uh, paul kind of hit, hit, hit it right on essentially uh just from my, my old coach experience you would just pick one thing so whoever that per, the person who kind of feels overwhelmed you would have to sit down and say you know why am i doing it and so what is the core reason do you want to get people registered to vote do you want to inform people do you want to make sure people get to the polls? You, what is it that, that's, that drove you to be interested to begin with, right? And then, and then just settle on that. You start with that one piece, and it's just like when you have to clean a house, you got to start somewhere, and, and you just you start with that first thing. Right, and one of the participants just emailed to me, remember to reach out to your colleagues. So Absolutely. you reach out to all the student groups even though you might be in, a, in housing or in student life or a faculty member, you reach out to faculty. You reach out even to community groups and say, we would like to be doing more with this. Who would like to help? Because there are so many people who recognize the importance of not graduating one more early cynic, but instead graduating students and giving them experiences while they're on campuses of how they are part of democracy and democracy only works when you get educated and engaged and active. So, um, yeah, I just yeah, wanted yeah, to know whether underscoring, underscoring that on. when we're approaching schools, I mean, sometimes there's sort of very logical places to work with the service learning, civic engagement office or student affairs, but sometimes, for whatever reason, those offices aren't available or aren't receptive. And we end up just advising our staffers to go into multiple channels because really it takes, you know, it takes a few champions to make things happen, and you never know where those champions are going to come from. And then they reach out and enlist those other folks who, who maybe were resistant at first. So the more the better. I'd like to jump in because uh, one of the uh, our attendees asked a question that uh, may be appropriate to answer right now. So what would be a good response to my vote doesn't matter? Well, one of the things we've got, I'm going to go to our memes page. Do we have that again? Um, we have a close, I mean, this is not a, this is a something created in response to um, you know, to be able, but we've got a, a close elections video that I'm not, it's 90 seconds, but I don't think I'll play it here. Although I suppose I could, I don't know. Um, it's a pretty good video. Um, do you want to take it 90 seconds? glitchy, so let's have them go to your, to your yeah, site. It's on, the memes, it's on the memes page of our site, which is under Get Out the Vote. And basically what we do is we just take about, because, you know, people's attention spans are short, and we take 90 seconds to go with examples from some that you probably know, like you know Bush running, winning the presidency in 2000 by 537 votes, to others that you may not know, like the tied Virginia election that controlled, the, decided control of the House of Delegates by a drawing names from a bowl because they were tied, and that one race determined that, to Bernie Sanders winning his first election by 10 votes, to a two-vote Senate race in 1974, and the fact that 50 schools had enrolled Enrollments larger in 2016 than the presidential margin in their states. Uh, you know, th th these these were the margins both ways. So we just basically yeah, that that's much more boring when I say it, but when you actually show it, it's actually it's actually pretty enticing. And I haven't showed it to anybody, no matter how politically sophisticated, who hadn't said, "Oh, I didn't know that about at least part of it." So you know, that's part of it. And then then part of it is. Um, when we say so so there's the you know i have only one vote it's not going to make a difference and we just give them examples i mean we participated in virginia in a race where the attorney general was 165 votes uh, i had the experience in volunteering and canvassing an election in my state of washington uh, where I got three votes in 2004 for the governor's candidate I was supporting. She won by 134 votes. So there's a lot of examples out there. And that's part of it, but it's not the only part because the complementary piece of that is saying, okay, so I understand that maybe it will make a difference in who gets elected, but then that's not going to make a difference because they're all corrupt. And I think there what you have to do, and this is where the guides are useful, is to say, let's look. I mean, we have guides, we have presidential guides from 16 still on our site. And just say, you know, these were really different positions that they had and really different policies and outcomes uh, based on who was elected. And then even beyond that, what we do say is that 
voting is essential, but it's not the only thing that you do. I mean, because I've spent my whole career with books like Soul of a Citizen writing about not just about voting, in fact, not very much about voting, but about other ways that people have made change in the US and globally. And so that complements the voting. And so if they feel like, oh, you know, this, I mean, I elected this person, but they've disappointed me, then you say, well, all right, sometimes candidates do disappoint you from whatever party, but you then have the power to organize, to build momentum, and then they're gonna be looking over their shoulder at the next, at the next election. I mean, whatever one thinks of gun issues, I don't think anybody can argue that the Parkland kids uh, didn't move move uh, discussion of it towards more salience. Um, and so I think those it complements each other, and that's part of what we have to teach people. And, and I do talk about a lot in this this essay that's on the site on political cynicism because um, you know that's really what we're talking about when somebody says my vote doesn't matter. I think it's let me add something to this. I think it's really important to tell stories of how one person did make a difference. Absolutely. So here's just one. Here's just one. Three of my students, uh, after they finished a course with me on renewable energies, heard that there was a national solar bank bill that was being considered. This is, this is going to be a bank where any of us could take money out to put a solar system on our home and then pay back out of the savings. And this was one of the many useful strategies we could have in this country to uh, move off of polluting fossil fuels and onto a clean energy future. Uh, a number of years ago when this was first considered, our own senator was saying he was going to vote against it. So these three students all called his office. And when the third student called, it actually got transferred to the senator. He says, I hear I'm getting calls on this. You're my third call today, and I want to hear more. So it's always useful when you call to say, you know, if you have, uh, if you want to talk, I have more information. The student was so nervous, but the student made a difference because he said solar energy works in Michigan. You should look into it. You should look into how the solar bank bill will help the constituents. And the senator said, okay, I'll look into it more and changed his vote. So I would suggest that there's valuable real estate all over the campus where you can post those stories, how you can make a difference. In fact, I like how um, science museums do it. They take advantage of the bathroom stalls, prime real estate, people read what's on those doors, put in stories of how people voted and they made a difference and how they can make a difference too with voting, with calling, with getting involved, building a healthier democracy. So just one example. Hey, Bo, did you wanna add something to that? Yeah, I guess I'm the cynic. So um, I would just, I would, uh, you know, there's the old, the old adage, uh, when you play the lottery, you got to be in it to win it. So, you know, if you go to the pubs and things and listen to people talk about politics, the first thing people say, they'll ask, hey, well, did you vote? And if, and the person said, well, you know, I didn't have time, something was going on. Then people say, man, you don't have any right to complain. What do you complain about? You need to be engaged, right? So there, there's got to be a selfish bit to it. If you want to make change, then you need to be engaged. I mean, I, I was working a poll just like you were talking about. I was working a poll, and a kid walked by, and, and, and I said, hey, man, so you, you registered? What's going on? What are, you, what are you interested in? And he wanted to have the basketball lights on later. And I said, are you all set? You're coming in? He goes, no, nah, man, I, you know, I, I didn't really participate in this kind of stuff. I was like, dude, the people that are, invite, they're, they're, that are being elected today will be the people who decide how late those lights stay on. And he kind of shook his head and realized, yeah, there's a self-interest in the process. And so, I mean, all the good, y'all said some really good stuff, but it, you got to be in it to win it. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have another question um, from an attendee who is on a campus where many students want to vote absentee. In 2016, they addressed this by offering absentee ballots along with registration forms and hosting an absentee ballot collection party. And they're doing the same this year um, and also mailing postcards to absentee voters, but they want to know uh, any best practices for supporting absentee voters that they may not be reaching. We've got some on our website. I mean, we generally encourage students to vote on their campus because it's simply 
then they can all get the same message about the logistics and when and where. And I think it builds community. But we do recognize that some students, you know, just may make a choice to vote in their home city or their home state. And so and again, some we go to states, seven you, key you ways can't vote. on that. So, yeah, I was just going to say some states, you can't vote with that address that you have at school. So you have to vote in your home. Well, no, that's actually yeah. not correct. Um, Basically, oh, correct me. There's a, okay. So there was a Supreme Court decision that gave the absolute right of students to choose where they registered to vote at home ah. or away. At absolute, you know. So at least right now, um, that is the right. And some schools, some students, some schools will make. I'm sorry. Some states will have specific requirements. So let me give you an example, which is in Ohio, if you live in a public on, on campus in a public university, um, you need to have a letter from the chancellor certifying that you're living in the dorms to be able to vote. Okay. If you're at a private, they have to supply a zero balance utility bill, um, sort of like, you know, you don't owe anything because you've already paid quite a lot of money and therefore, but you have the equivalent of your utility bill. So every state's laws are slightly sure. different. And we use a, it's a campus vote project as a partner of ours. We refer people to those laws. Uh, they've got very good summaries, but it is an absolute right to register on campus, and we certainly encourage it. Oh, thank you. For yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. Paul's exactly right. And the campus vote project is really good with that, has really great information on that. I, I agree. Uh, the only one thing I'd say about the absentee ballots is that. Um, U.S. Vote Foundation is another good resource and make the, they make the process easy. And the, the one thing that you have to do, be mindful of when you do a absentee ballot sort of campaign, is you're going to have to remind folks because they'll still fill out that form and not remember to, to follow up, right? So you need to make sure, hey, once one get send the information in, request your ballot, but um, you kind of know when the voter registration deadlines are, remind people that they should either contact the state office or have have a way that they're being reminded to, that they need to follow up to make sure they get those ballots. Right, and they differ by state by state, which makes it, which is part yeah. of what makes it more challenging. So you need to be able to have that information accessible. Thank you very much. We have another question. As a state higher education institution, how do you respond to um, 501c4s that want to partner? I was always taught to stay with the nonpartisan C3s and stay away from the political C4s. Have norms changed? Uh, just speaking from from our and from the uh, from higher education perspective, no, you should. It, it, we're, we we kind of follow the League of Women Voters model. It should be nonpartisan. Uh, you, you invite uh, all the qualified candidates to campus. Uh, it's just a safer way to go. And if those folks want to be more aggressive in what they do, uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, through the National Campus Voter Registration Project, we would count, we would partner with Rock the Vote, with the WWE, the wrestlers. And so those groups can do what they want, but anything that you, that you host on campus should be uh, nonpartisan and invite you know, all the candidates, if you're doing an education forum, invite the, you know, both liberal, you know, Republicans, Democrats, independents, whoever's out there, Green Party, uh, make sure everyone is able to participate. Yeah, I, I would concur in that. Essentially, I mean, if you think of the campus as a commons, everybody is welcome on it. So campaigns are welcome and candidates are welcome and outside political groups are welcome. But in terms of any kinds of formal collaborations, you really want to st restrict yourself to the to the C3 folks. And even in some ways to the non, I mean, because C3 is, has a pretty wide variant. Um, so the non part, the, one, the ones that really are nonpartisan. Um, I just, it, it's a safer way to go. And we, we, we're faced with this all the time where some group wants to partner with us. And we say, you know, honestly, you know, you're doing good work. You're trying to engage youth, you, you know, who can complain, complain about that, whatever your political perspective, but we cannot formally partner with you because you're just more of an advocacy group and our schools will feel uncomfortable about that. You know, but, but again, everybody's welcome on campus and that's, and that's important. I mean, you don't want to just say you cannot come on campus or, you know, you, we want we want folks coming on, even if it's a little bit of a pain in the butt at some point. You know, making the arguments, supporting their candidates. But again, you're not formally collaborating with them. You're just saying this is an open space where people can come in and talk with our students, and anybody can do that. Uh, 
Okay. I have a, uh, another question that I wanted to ask you both, just purely logistical. Let's say that people get started on something and then they're, they have a question. Um, I know, Bo, is there an active person that can be called or is there an email on the site? And same with you, Paul. I know that your staff is so stretched with all these states you're working with. But what if people get started and they do have a question? What do you recommend? Well, for us, I would say look at our website and see if there's a state staffer. Um, we don't work in all states in terms of having direct staff. You know, again, we supply resources for all staffers, but if you're in one of the states where there is a staffer, um, they would be very happy to get back to you. Um, you know, we're talking 22 states. So, you know, it's roughly half of them, it's just not all of them. You know, Missouri, Minnesota, Ohio, Virginia, North Carolina, Nevada, Colorado, Montana, uh, you know, it's Ohio again, Pennsylvania, uh, Mississippi, Tennessee, um, you know, so essentially that's what we would recommend. And if it's another question, well, you know, we are available, but we are also incredibly overloaded. So, uh, you know, look at our website first, see if we have, a, you know, see if we have, uh, you know, resources that we probably already do. And we may, you know, we'll try and get back, but, you know, recognize that we're human, we're human beings juggling 75 things and you know and are pretty overloaded that makes sense well that also brings up something else for you paul which is you might be able to use some help from people who are willing to work with you on kind of a state level basis so if there are on this webinar people who have time to do that volunteering to help um, that they could contact you about helping with the state level work i would think well so, yeah, and, and it's a little complicated, um, you know, because again, especially too much, you know, it's more complicated the closer you get to the election, the, the more hectic things yep. get. So, yep. you know, what I would say is if they are in a state that we're working in, again, just, you know, go to our site, check our staff page, and that tells you which states we're working in. Then by all means, you know, if they wanted to help, contact the state director and they'll say, oh, okay, we already got three people at your school, why don't you work together with them? Uh, or, my God, we don't have anybody at your school, that's wonderful. Um, you know, if you're at a different state, um, it's most, I mean, mostly what we would do is say, here it is, this is a self-guided nature tour. And and that can be pretty effective. I mean, I remember I was at a, I think it was American Democracy Project conference, where I, I you know, I always go to the stuff on elections for obvious reasons. And I sat and it was University of Central Oklahoma. And they did a presentation and I thought it was a pretty good one. I was like, I came up afterwards and we've never worked in Oklahoma. We just don't have the resources. And I said, God, that seems a lot like our project. Do you know about our project? And they're like, well, of course we know about your project. We've been using your resources. We've been adapting your resources. And so by now, what I would say is, particularly if you look, we just updated seven key ways, um, you know, a couple months ago. I mean, pretty much anything you would want to do there is, you know, there we have a resource on how to do it. And so, you know, now if somebody says to me, okay, I've got 40 hours a week to, or maybe even 25 to contribute, volunteer, and I'm in this state, and, you know, I'm at, I have this position, and I'd love to be able to, you know, to help. Well, you know, we might be able, you know, we might be able to do something even at this late date, certainly, you know, next year when things slow down a little bit, we're always open to, you know, um, basically, you know, creative solutions. Um, the person who handles Nevada for us is terrific, has made terrific headway with the schools and works as a volunteer. So it's, you know, it's not impossible. Um, but again, just, you know, be, be cognizant of the practical realities, I guess. Right, you know. right. Okay, and, good. Uh, oh, what about you? Yeah, the National Campus Voter Registration Project, if you go to your Vote Your Voice, the website, um, we have a map there that links to all the state voter registration people, state elections folks. And, and so they'll have contacts. If you have a specific question about uh, something you're trying to do on campus, you can just contact us uh, directly, send an email, and, and, and uh, someone from the campaign will respond. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, if there are more questions that got sent in, then uh, I can't see them, so maybe somebody could share them. Otherwise, I'm thinking 
we could go to closing comments. Um, I want to thank everybody who is on this webinar today for everything that you are going to do between now and the election. And remember, guilt and blame is a waste of time. So celebrate each of the steps that you do take. Don't despair or worry that you can't do more. Uh, reach out to others to help increase your capacity to accomplish more. Many people are worried if we can turn worry into action, then I think we'll have a better democracy for all. So I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank HIA. The Higher Education Association Sustainability Consortium has really stepped up to the plate this year on a number of really important issues. They put in the extra time and effort um, if you haven't looked yet at projectsthatmatter.org, please, all of you, take a look at that because that's where you can post ongoing projects to connect your students and your staff and faculty with sustainability issues. We will have a webinar on that later this fall, but you can look at it now, projectsthatmatter.org. If you're interested in climate policy specifically, um, AISHI has a website and an initiative created by he asked just for that. It's known as Beyond Doom and Gloom, Engage in Climate Solutions. It's on an AISHI link, but the fast way to get to it is just to go to climatefixes.org. I also want to note everybody who's on the webinar, please look at the resources that have been listed in the chat box. Um, those of you watching the recording, there will be also an attachment for you, but many of the great resources that were named today uh, are in the chat box for you to utilize right away. So are there other questions or should we go to closing comments? Uh, I, we can go to closing comments. So uh, Paul, would you like to go first? Sure. So again, and I think I mentioned this earlier, which is, sometimes we get very fatalistic about things and we say what we do is not going to matter you know we do it the students do it i would i would actually suggest that often the students get it from us maybe not us particularly but certainly from academia in general um and so our challenge is to really view this as contingent on our actions and i'm thinking about again i mentioned this from the little video we've got you know that tie vote that determined the control of the virginia house of delegates and had one more student voted, well, it doesn't matter which side they voted on. One way or another, they wouldn't have had to draw names out of a bowl. And that's, I think all of us would argue that that's a better way to run a democracy than drawing names out of a bowl to decide control of a state legislature. So, you know, you don't know. I mean, in the period that we've worked, there have been an enormous amount of close elections and you just don't really know. And so I think the challenge is to get every student on your campus, whatever their political beliefs, to get them to recognize that it's they could be that vote. Uh, you know, and if they bring 10 friends to the polls or they volunteer, they could definitely be their vote. And so to make it contingent on actions for the students, but also for faculty, staff, administrators, student government, the people who are the potential influencers. Uh, and that it really is, I mean, there's things we can't control, but certainly there are things we can impact and the, there's no question out of the you know we've been doing this project now piloted in 08 steadily since 2012 that we have impacted participation rates at schools and what that means is the schools did the heavy lifting and the schools did it and uh convinced students that it was worth it and helped give them the tools to participate and again whatever one's politics i can't think of a better more impactful thing to do in a democracy the other thing, of course, is that when students do vote, uh, there's data for about 70, I think going back about 70 years, that if you vote in three elections in a row, three major elections, you will have a higher percentage of voting the rest of your life. So we're not just doing this for the present, we're also doing this for the future. Thank you, Paul. And Bo, closing comments? Yeah, just briefly, just a reminder that um, state voter registration deadlines will begin to sort of cascade and close uh, starting October 6th. So October 6th, October 7th, some of the first states begin saying that's, you know, that's the end for voter registration and it'll go all the way till the end of October. So, you, you know, September, this is the time to, to be fully engaged and to make sure folks who want to vote are registered is now. 
And so I would I would encourage people kind of them to uh, get off the starting blocks and do whatever they're going to do uh, now. And then I'd just like to say um, thank you for their good efforts because I know a lot people are doing a lot of really positive things on campus. Uh, please share your stories, share them with Paul's group, share them with mine, share them with Ash, share them with the with, with all of us so that we can pass along the good work that um, all of us in higher education are doing to um, to civically engage students and uh, to promote democracy. Thank you so much, Bo and uh, Paul and Deb. Uh, I will also like to remind everyone about the Campus Sustainability Month page and also the resources that we have on, on, on that page. Uh, especially, please share with us your plans and uh, pr promote Campus Sustainability Month. And as I've mentioned before, we have this promotional toolkit uh, available here with suggested copy for your website and newsletters and uh, social media, uh, also a template press release. So please do uh, make use of these uh, resources as well. And um, before we end the webinar today, I also wanted to let um, everyone know about our next webinar um titled professional skills in sustainability it will take place next wednesday starting at 3 p.m this webinar provides an overview of professional skills in sustainability and discusses activities for teaching and learning these skills you can learn more about the webinar and all of our other professional development offerings on our website and i hope you'll join us again i want to thank everybody for attending all of our collaborators and uh, especially the presenters today for a wonderful webinar. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you.